Welcome to the Social Impact Level Up podcast. This is where we blur the lines between business, nonprofit, and impact. I'm your host, Wendy V, and in season three, we're redefining success for social entrepreneurs looking to grow their revenue. If you have reality changing ideas, this is the place for you. Let's jump right into today's episode. So who do you call if you don't know exactly how to make the best impact as a volunteer? Well, my guest today is Kristen Kane, and she's going to tell us exactly how we can do this. We are probably, you know, as entrepreneurs, one of the groups who has the most flexibility in our schedule to give back through volunteering. So why not add this to your repertoire of how you make an impact as an entrepreneur? All right, Kristen, I'm going to turn it over to you to tell our audience who you are and how you make an impact. Awesome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm Kristen Kane. I'm the founder and CEO of Charity Connect, a nonprofit that I started in December 2015 in an effort to facilitate volunteerism through personal connection. I love that. And since then, how many people have you connected? You know what? It's funny, Wendy. I get that question a lot and I honestly haven't stopped to count. I think the reason why is I don't feel like it's the proper metric for me. I think the metric for the impact that Charity Connect makes is the fact that the people that I'm matching are sticking with it year after year. They're getting recognized as volunteer of the year. They're getting offered jobs at their volunteer sites. It's that ripple effect, that sustainability that comes from the match that I'm most proud of. I love that. That's so great. And so you've been doing this for quite a long time as a social entrepreneur. You got started, um, I'm assuming this wasn't your first rodeo that you did. <laughs> so how did you decide to do this or what, what's the story, the backstory? <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the rodeo started early for me and included several rounds in the ring that I, <laughs> I don't know how far I'll be able to carry that metaphor. But yeah, I actually got involved in service at a really young age. I was four years old and had a friend with cystic fibrosis. So I did participated in fundraising events for him and kind of, you know, dipped my toe in the water literally and and, you know, figuratively. And <laughs> then I continued to raise money for cystic fibrosis. I hosted my own event in college and then began working for the CF Foundation upon graduation. So that was where the nonprofit background experience came into play. What I loved most about being a special events fundraiser was teaching the parents how to raise money. I like that education piece and teaching people about cystic fibrosis. So I went back and got my master's in uh, elementary education and I became a teacher, which I loved. And then when I was staying home with my children, I ran my daughter's Girl Scout troop for eight years, kind of got a little bait and switched into that. I had never done a Girl Scouts before. And a friend said, let's do it. And I thought it was for a year. And then eight years later, we're, we're doing planning all these things and earning all these badges. And I really earned probably almost every badge with a service component. It's just what I, the twist I like to apply to things. And I thought, why not? If we have these things we have to do, why not do it in a way that helps our community? So I got to know a lot of local nonprofits through those efforts. And when I decided to go back to work or you know, start my next chapter, I thought, well, I could go teaching. I could work in nonprofit. But what I had noticed were there were a lot of people that wanted to volunteer and weren't. They saw what I was doing in the community and wanted a part of that. And I didn't understand at first all the barriers that existed. And then when I stopped to think about it, I thought, someone needs to get in there and, and help these people connect these people that awesome resource of people that wanted to volunteer. Someone needs to get in there and help them do so. And that's what I started doing and have refined that process and just really focusing on that piece of getting people from a place of wanting to volunteer to happily volunteering. And you mentioned the barriers. Can you describe exactly what are some of the barriers? I mean, I'm sure if people have been looking for volunteer opportunities before, they might have encountered them on their own. But it might be good just to recap what, what kinds of things happen when you try to make an impact sometimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
time is number one, right? A lot of people say they want to, it's something they want to do and they'll do it when things calm down or when things, you know, when their kids go off to college or when they retire. And I myself have said, I'll do such and such when things calm down. And I have yet to witness things calming down. So (laughs) I really like to work with people to show them how they can start volunteering now. And a lot of times that's integrating it with the things that they want to do or have to do now. So time's a big barrier. We're lucky to have so many ways to volunteer in our area. There's so many nonprofits, which is awesome, but sometimes that can be overwhelming when you start searching. Nonprofits themselves are super busy. So sometimes they might not be able to return a call or, and it doesn't take much for someone to stop trying to get frustrated and meet that barrier. So I find that doing it through personal conversation and helping them be mindful about why they want to volunteer, how they want to volunteer, and getting to them a point that when they are introduced to the nonprofit, they're empowered to know what they want to do, what they don't want to do, what they want to get out of it, what exact time do they offer. And that just helps smooth the transition. Want to amplify your impact today? Join my community, the Social Impact Level Up Collective, where social entrepreneurs just like you meet monthly to inspire world-changing ideas. You'll get access to my top courses and resources, speakers, and exclusive community events. Hop in right now at wendyvelos.com backslash collective. Yeah, that's so nice because you, then you know exactly how it fits into your life or your schedule and what you whatever you have going on on a normal basis. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is a really great concept because you talked about the personalization of what you do. Um, and can you describe a little bit about, and I guess I know it from having talked to you before, how this matching process works? So how exactly do you get kind of aligned with the right organization? So this is something that I've refined over the years, have worked with my advisory board, have really tried to be mindful of myself. What's the best, most thorough way to get someone from point A to point B? And what I've come across is a system in which the first step feels, it still feels, I've now employed it for about two years, it still feels not like me. And the reason is I don't talk to my client first, which is so... I mean, you know me, that's so against me. But what I found was I was, there's certain questions I want to ask of people in the beginning. And I was always doing that in my one-on-one meetings with them. But I think that I could potentially bias. I could jump ahead. It's very natural. I was a psych undergrad, so I brought that to the table too. And I feel like I was jumping ahead or they were jumping ahead. The energy between us was causing us to potentially skip the the mindful process, the slow process. So the first step now in my process is that I have a new client fill out a self-inventory form, which is 16 questions that I've honed over my eight years of matching. They do that on their own. And then it comes to me and I spend some time on my own with those answers. I prepare a Google document with my first thoughts based just on their answers, not influenced by them or their personality yet. And I'll tell you, sometimes I always get good information. Sometimes I get feedback like, oh, this is not really a form person. (laughs) They're not giving me much. Other times I get a lot, but I still feel like there's been this more scientific approach where they have considered the questions, I have given some thought and hyperlinked some nonprofits, and we come to our first meeting, there's nothing standing in our way. We just, we get going. We start talking about the things that I found. I ask more questions if they weren't a foreign person and didn't give me a lot of information. So I ask more questions. I dig deeper. We start really talking about Can they picture themselves in this opportunity? Do we need to try to create a new opportunity, one that doesn't exist, uh, which often happens through conversations with nonprofit contacts? So that's the second, that's the meaty part of the process. We've got the forum, we've got the meetings. It's between two to four meetings typically to get it done. The next step is sometimes meeting with my nonprofit contact to discuss it. Sometimes it's having my client go try an opportunity, call me on the way home, let me know how it went. 
I stick with them until they're happily volunteering at at least one organization. That's really neat because they kind of get that catering approach or the all the, like the introduction, the warm handoff to the organization so they don't have to cold call some number and say, hey, do you have a volunteer department or a volunteer coordinator? And can awesome. I sign up to give out something? <laughs> you know, so <Yeah. laughs> that's great. And so pivoting just a little bit to think about what people could receive or get from the experience of just being a volunteer, you know, why, why does one volunteer? Why does one spend your time sort of volunteering? What exactly is it that your clients are really looking for when they come to you and want, say, hey, I want to volunteer? I mean, it seems like on the surface, it might just be giving back, but I assume that there might be other, other reasons why people are deciding to, to kind of go down this route. I'm glad that you're curious about that because that is something I stress. One of my questions I ask is why you want to volunteer. And I make sure to let them know that making a difference or helping people, I already got that part. That's inherent. I know that. So you can't use that as one of your reasons you want to volunteer. I really encourage people to dig deeper. Is it that they want to meet new people, meet like-minded people? Is it that they want to network? Is it for a career goal? I've worked with people who are re-entering the workforce after a break and want to kind of hone their skills. I've worked with people who've been considering pivoting in their careers. And instead of making a full-on jump, trying something out through volunteering, making connections, learning about it. Is this what I really want? I want to start shifting my path to. So the why do you want to volunteer? I really dig, 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 and try to get as many reasons about what they might want to accomplish. Maybe they want to spend more time doing their hobby and they can do that. I can try to find them a way to serve their community while also spending time doing their hobby. So there's lots of creative things that we can do to help people accomplish something else they want to get out of their volunteering while they help other people. And that's how I find that they can give more naturally. If it integrates into their life and helps them cross something else off their want to do or their have to do list at the same time, it'll stick. It'll fit right in. And we all know that a good fit volunteer opportunity benefits you a ton on the inside. You're getting those good feelings, that energy, those goosebumps. That's a feeling we want and we want to keep having. Yeah, I think there's somewhere in there about just positive life experiences though, right? Like I think more and more of us need those types of memorable, uplifting, inspirational things in our life that happen, you know, maybe not just the day to day, go to work and <laughs> keep going about whatever it is that we're doing. So, you know, those moments, I think people really live for that, that memory of it as well as you move forward. And I think it can get you out of your head. It can get you, it's a really good, the right fit. And I'll keep saying, I'll stop myself, I'll stop you, I'll stop anyone and say, has to be the right fit, has to be something that you want to be doing. And then it, it can be meditative. It can get you focusing on other people instead of maybe some internal struggles you have going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the fit is really important. And that's something that you shortcut for people is how to find the right organization because you have a network of nonprofits that are just amazing. I know I've interviewed a lot of them because you fed them to me for this podcast. So a lot of our listeners may have heard of them before. Um, but can you talk a little bit about your network of, of wonderful partners that you have and, and kind of um, maybe highlight some of the things that they do or, or what kind of um, brought you to share, you know, those particular um, opportunities with your volunteer friends? Yeah. And, and one thing I want to clarify to a lot of questions I get about this, they ask, nonprofits will ask, or just people that are interested to ask if nonprofits have to pay anything for me to match volunteers to them. And the answer is no. So I am not out there recruiting for nonprofits. I'm working for my clients who do pay. They pay a one-time $100 fee for the volunteer connection service that goes to pay the expenses of Charity Connect because we are volunteer led and all volunteer staff. And the nonprofits, they're responsive to me and they're responsive to my, the, to my client, the person that I placed there. And that's really all they have to do. I created a form for them to engage with us as well, because it got to the point, you know, when I first started, it was like 
I guess when I, day one, I had maybe relationships with 25 nonprofits and now I'm well over 200 nonprofits. So it's a little hard to keep it all in my head. So I have them create, uh, excuse me, fill out our nonprofit needs assessment form, which is the basic information that I need to match them. And then I follow up with email asking those questions to get it all digitally captured. Then when I have a client, that's a good fit for them. I think it will be a good fit. Then we have a meeting we want to dig deeper and kind of see how we would integrate that person that we have in mind. I am adding new nonprofit partners every day. I have a wide variety. They do so many different things from youth development, shelter services, uh, animal uh, services, immigration, uh, helping people with uh, special needs, you know, really across the board. And I think that's super important because I'm all about the right fit. So, and I think there's something out there for everyone. You just have to find it or create it. Yeah, no, that's that's so cool because I think that a lot of people have interests and they don't maybe explore them fully or think about, you know, oh, these things light me up. Maybe I should volunteer and explore more in this area. And that might bring me more fulfillment outside of my work hours and, and really benefit my life. And I try to explain to people that it's really about um, sometimes thinking, how can I give back in terms of dollars, people, time, and donations? So there's a lot of different ways and, and donations, uh, not monetary donations, because that's dollars. Those, those dollars are the first things that a lot of people think of like when they interact with nonprofits because they might be used to getting the tax write-off or the tax deduction. But the the other donations you can give are like space, um, you know, goods that you have from your business or other tangible goods. Um, I've had a donation of a hundred Christmas trees when I was a volunteer coordinator back in the day. So that was an interesting, awesome. yeah, that was an interesting one. He was a very handsome gentleman too. So I was like, I will happily take these Christmas trees and talk to you for like a half hour. Um, but the, the point of it is the other two, the time part, which could be the volunteer time that you're talking about sometimes also can be expressed in terms of people power or just kind of showing up. So that's why the the, best of the people, but the, the time also could be expressed in terms of billable hours and pro bono services and other ways that you could give your time that are mm-hmm. not like you don't always have to go and move a box or do a thing. So there's, there's lots yeah. of different ways to volunteer, quote unquote, or interact with a nonprofit. Um, I'm yeah. curious if you can think of any other ways ways that people are, you know, giving or non are kind of, I use that framework just to help people break down basics, but there's yeah. tons of different ways that people could, could kind of activities you could do to volunteer. Could you think of some other ways to explain it to folks of what they could be thinking about? Absolutely. So the two things that are popping up in my head as you speak about it, one is that consultative manner that you were talking about. So that has been something I've had a lot of clients recently, just brilliant, brilliant people who want to volunteer and they want to use the all the knowledge and skills that they've gained from throughout their career. And so I've been very impressed with the nonprofits that I've been working with to be open and allow this new person in, in this very high level manner, right? So I've matched volunteers where they're coaching staff on best practices and things like that. A lot of opportunities that you wouldn't find if you just went to their website and looked at the volunteer opportunities, you know, the nonprofit's not going to post that they're looking for that, but I kind of operate on a hunch. Like, would you be open to this? And it's just been a really neat thing to broker that, um, on kind of a lighter note, I believe in social volunteering and kind of parties with a purpose. So getting friends together and, doing a recipe swap and making one to taste and one to donate or getting people together and putting together snack bags to donate and like doing a little art project, you know, things like that. Um, Even just going through your house and seeing what you have to donate to a local charity and then offering to be a donations carpool person where other people could drop at your house and you could drop it off. There's so many ways to get involved in health and it really feels good when you do it. 
I love the parties with the purpose. That definitely falls into the people. I, that's, a, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. The other one I didn't mention too that people forget about sometimes is just a percentage of your proceeds, right? And that that is always a very common thing you see. You think of it as like the pizza night approach, but any business could do a percentage of proceeds on a product, a service, or a specific time frame of providing something. Absolutely. And I really believe in win-win. You know, when I did some percent of sales events before, we did it on a night that the restaurant wasn't typically busy, right? So they're getting all these people in that weren't there before and donating a part of their proceeds. It doesn't have to be a hardship for them. They don't have to lose money during this time, you know, with this event. On a similar note, I work with people and I always encourage them to post about their volunteering on social media. And they are hesitant a lot of times and say, oh, well, then people will just think that I only volunteered so that I could say my company was super cool and we volunteer. And I throw that out the window. There's no guilt or shame allowed in my volunteer house, you know, because this brings much needed attention to the nonprofit through a tag. And it shows people what you stand for, your brand, as well as inspiring other people. They might look at that and say, oh, I could do that. I could do that with my company. Or, hey, I didn't even know about that nonprofit and it's 10 minutes from my house. I might give it another way. So people need to not be shy about that. There's no problem with you getting a little positive press with your service because it serves all those other purposes as well. Yeah, I think that's the crux of my my whole business model is that you're probably missing out on business if you're giving and not telling the story of your giving and through your marketing in a structural way and not a performative way. So you yeah. have to you have to give it back into your proceeds of what you want to give if you want to make a bigger impact. So because a business who doesn't make any kind of profit can't make an impact. So you yeah. have to it has to come back to you in some way. But I think a lot of people are feel fearful of that, right? Because it's it's a um a space that has been traversed, maybe not in the best way in the, in the past and communities or people have been slighted by businesses and especially big corporations in the past and sure. nonprofits have had maybe not the best corporate partners sometimes. And so you have to think about it, you know, from I think all angles and say, if you are really genuinely trying to give, you want to do it in a way that demonstrates it's coming from a values-based approach for your business. And I think one of the things that I try to work with when people is having an established impact mission, <laughs> because when it's yeah. there written in writing and says, this is how we give, this is how a nonprofit works with us. This is the, the ways that we give. And these are the reasons why we give. Those things are you know, go a long way with helping people to trust you. And I think that that's something that's really important when you're talking about, you know, community partnerships and, and private public private partnerships. Absolutely. Yeah. So the other questions I want to ask you are more about you because you're an interesting bird. <laughs> you have you. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I just, I, I love your energy, but you're just such a, such a great you. person in, in general. Um, but you are a mom, right? You, yeah. You have a family. So, so how did you decide to, after you were had some mommy time to then, you know, as a woman, go back and start something of your own? What was that journey like to kind of make that mindset shift? Well, I have a really cute little story that just encapsulates that whole thing. So I went to coffee with my brother and I was telling him, I was at this, you know, crossroads of what I wanted to do. And I was talking to him about it. And I said, what I, I really want to do is I want to start this business, uh, this nonprofit, helping people connect to volunteer opportunities. I see this need. I don't feel like I haven't found any organization that's doing it the way I want to do it through conversation and, you know, personal attention and customized placement. And he said, you should do it. This is great. And he's a big entrepreneur. And, you know, that, that was his deal. That wasn't my deal. So, and I, I said to him, I'm worried that I'm going to get consumed with it. And I'm, I'm not going to be there for my kids. Cause they were like, you know, I mean, this was eight years ago. I'm trying to do the math. So they were like 10 and 12. And I knew that I was lucky enough to be able to stay home with them. And I wanted to be around for them. And my whole family's here and it's all very important to me. And I thought, well, what if, what if I just get real down the rabbit hole and I'm, I'm doing it all the time. And he just looked at me and he goes, you're not going to do that. And so I started it and he was right. 
you know, when you're, you were an entrepreneur and you set your own hours and, you know, sometimes it was like working late at night, but I was happy to do it because I loved the work. And then it was like, oh, I got to go to my kid's soccer game. I'm out. I'm not available. I'm going to do that right now. So it really has worked. And, and I, I'm happy that they've seen me do this. Oh, you're right. The time flexibility is is important to exercise because otherwise you just created a whole nother like beyond nine to five for yourself <laughs> because you are working yeah. those late hours sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So then in, in that case, has there been somewhere along the lines that has required some sort of pivot or shift that you've had to kind of learn? Well, can now maybe I'm in a different place or I've had to redefine success for myself. What What's kind of made you change action along the way? I like that you asked that because I feel like, you know, like, you know, there was right (laughs) with everyone. And I think for me, the biggest, there was little things, but I think the biggest thing was I, I was so passionate. I am so passionate about what I'm doing that when I first started, I was like, I will help everyone. I will work with everyone. And there were just no parameters. At one point I was featured in the daily skim and it blew up and I was working with people in California and I was like, this is amazing. I'm going to take charity connect everywhere. I'm going to charity connect everyone. Wendy, I am one person. What, why could I No, Thank you. That does not work. I don't know 200 nonprofits in California. So I was having to you know, get to know the nonprofits. I was creating more work for myself and I was burning myself out. So then I said, Nope, not going to do it. I was working with schools here. I mean, I was doing everything. I just, there was so much to be done and I wanted to do it all. And then I said, I work with adults in the Metro DC area. I work with individuals, not groups. I like clarify And I think that I see that with some of my nonprofit partners, especially the new ones that start, we have so much passion and we want to do it all and help it all. And you need to find your niche. You need to find your lane and stay in your lane because there's plenty of work to be done there. Oh man, there's so much work for everybody, I think. (laughs) And it's, it's fun to say that, you know, I I do think a lot of people have had to make some shortest shifts, but it's, it's important that you, you mention refining what you already were thinking, you know, geographically is a great lesson or by, um, age group you mentioned, like you mentioned a couple of really important ones, because even when you think of who you could possibly serve, I mean, I I don't know, as a business coach that I'm going to be serving a 15 year old because because it's just not going to be someone who's typically in business, you know? So you yeah. have to think about those things unless I'm starting a teen entrepreneur program and then it might be, you know, so it's really yeah. kind of, it, it's about always about who are you, who are you serving? How are you serving? And what exactly are you doing? The other question I'm going to ask before we go to our final question is just about how do you maintain your own well-being and continue to show up as a mom and in your business? And as you said, you made some boundaries <laughs> somewhere along the way. So I'm sure you made some lessons in that space as well. So what do you do to maintain your own wellness? Well, I'm very lucky, first of all, that I'm doing what I feel like I was, I've always been meant to do. It feels very right for me. I get to work with people who want to do good and organizations are doing good. So there's a lot of just good feelings, good vibes associated with the main, my main gig, but I also play a whole lot of pickleball. And I am obsessed with pickleball. I even took a part-time gig working at a pickleball, indoor pickleball place because I want to be around other people that are obsessed with pickleball and help them play it. So that is like a huge passion of mine and just spending time with my family. I love being active. I love being outside. So it's, it's all about balance. I'm about to be an empty nester. My husband and I are trying to just be like, that's so exciting because it mostly is. <laughs> and, you know, planning concerts and trips and stuff like that. So just this balance, a lot of balance. That is such a great story. <laughs> I love I, the empty nesting is is serious, but the pickleball um, it, people are very into it, and and I didn't realize how much around, especially I guess of the whole nation. But I know DC has been like ramping up with pickleball, and there's entire businesses now for pickleball courts and gyms that have pickleball are like preferred. <laughs> it's a whole vibe. <laughs> It's, it's a whole vibe and being there and being around other people who are like, ah, I get to play pickleball. I mean, they're that excited about it. That, those are my, that's my tribe right there. 
So yeah. shout out to Dill Dinkers. That's, that's the place. So. <laughs> that's where you play. That's, that's cool. where I work part-time and play. Oh and man. No, oh, you're really into it. <laughs> you know, it. like beyond. <laughs> Someone the other day said, I didn't realize how into pickleball you are. I'm like, oh, it's a whole thing. <laughs> like, this is my pickleball ensemble. <laughs> this is no, yeah. <laughs> like, I have pickleball. People give me pickleball branded, like, you know, oh, gifts. And yeah, man, it's so kind good. of a nut. It's when weird. I'm passionate about stuff, volunteering, pickleball. It, yeah. Like, you know, it's like when it's I'm pretty boundless. I love that though, because we all have to have our little things that make us excited. I get excited about buggering off and um, paddle boarding for like half of a Friday. Nice. That's yeah. Nice. I, I will be out on whatever beautiful lakes here in Maryland, just paddle boarding in the sun. I do like and bathing and laying there like a turtle. It's great. <laughs> That sounds awesome. I love it. All summer. Um, So last question, I guess, is just where can people connect with you to um, one, find out more about what you do and if they have any further thoughts or wonderings after listening to this episode? Yeah, I'd love to connect with people. Our website's a great place. That's charityconnect.us. Uh, we're active on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, connecting with me on LinkedIn is great. Uh, yeah, I love I love meeting new friends. I'll talk to them about volunteering and pickleball until the cows come home. <laughs> <laughs> but only if you live in the D.C. region. No, I was kidding. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But they can still like friend me. And, you know, yeah. I do think following us on social media, regardless of if you live locally, I, the, our goal through our social media is to inspire other people. And they might say, wow, look at that nonprofit and what they're doing. I wonder if there's one in my area. So I can't physically match everyone. So I like for them to go and, and learn from what we're doing and try to, to do it where they live too. Yeah. And maybe there is somebody in California who wants to do this for the California nonprofits. You never know. <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah. Right. That might be a way to reach more people. Um, so it's been so good to have you, my friend. Thank you for all the wonderful guests that you brought to the show and all the energy you brought to us today. And um, thank you to all the listeners and stay tuned for another wonderful episode. Thanks so much. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and we look forward to having you come back. If you're curious about something we shared, make sure you check in the show notes below. And do you want the secret to make your nonprofit or business more sustainable and more profitable? Hop into my Learn, Grow, Thrive University, where I give you exclusive access to resources, mini courses, and templates for free. All you need to do is sign up at wendybelows.com backslash university. See you next episode.